Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 227, Lecture, a Reflection on Change. Yes, this is the added magical instalment in our Star Wars Lecture series and it exists for a reason that we'll talk about in a second. We're about to launch into a series of truly remarkable requests. Doug, I'm looking at you Doug, Doug you're a legend, Doug wants me to talk through the plurality of academic writing and we'll go there. Tom wants me to talk about a PhD career development and personal branding, very happy to do that. And Chemi, your session on the book chapter is coming shortly. But I did want to acknowledge one more moment in our teaching and learning journey on this rather cold Adelaide morning. And this request came from so many of you who wrote to me through the lecture series. And you said to me, the exact same thing that happened to me happened to you. You're in the middle of a PhD or you just finished it and you got a job and the university sort of just randomly threw you into teaching a very large lecture and lecture series without any professional development or help. Right. So therefore, I did want to take one more vlog to bring this academic story of the lecture home to your career and I also wanted to log something sociologically and historically significant and that is this moment of COVID. What have we gone through in the last few months? And I want to log the scale, the scope of the work, the effort, the trauma, the chaos that we've all lived through and let's try and create a little bit of meaning from it. Because what's happening at the moment, and this is really disturbing me, can I say, what's happening at the moment is this bizarre parallel between a bunch of people who say, oh, look, we're returning to normal. Yeah, we're there, we're gonna to return to normal. And it's a bunch of dark, dark Gothic people for whom I have great sympathy who are going, nothing will ever be the same again. <laughs> Now, of course, the truth, as always, is, is somewhere in the middle. But what I did want to log, I really wanted to log this moment and log that a large number of you, our teachers, our lecturers, our academics, have suffered in the last few months. And I didn't want to sweep that under the carpet or forget about it. I wanted to log it, remember it, and see what we can learn from it. Now, as Dean, I saw these radical shifts in teaching and learning at a distance and indeed one step removed because in this house where we're recording on this early Saturday morning in Adelaide I was in this house and we have lectures next uh, we have offices next to each other and I was hearing remarkable innovations occurring in the office next door every single day I was hearing the nightmare seeing the nightmare of the quick 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 changes and the speed of the transformation so to acknowledge your incredible efforts in the last few months, to really remember this time, I wanted to log it and explore the short, medium and long-term consequences of COVID on us and on our universities. And I also want to think about your careers in the longer term. And of course, as you can see, I have a guest. I haven't had a guest in a very, very long time. Welcome to social distancing. We are close, <laughs> but we are allowed to be, but more of that later. And look, I am going to involve Jamie in this conversation because he lived it. And I'm going to ask him, and I hope it's useful for his career too, to reflect a little bit on what actually has happened and what may occur from here. So Professor Jamie Quinton, Okay, am I allowed to introduce you? Can I introduce you? So, then, then you're on. All then right. you're on. All Let right. me just say how fabulous you are. <laughs> professor Jamie Quinton is the Professor of Physics, Professor of Nanotechnology at Flinders University. He now has, and we did the count this morning, 139 refereed articles. We're going for 140, 150 before Christmas, brother. Come on. Uh, he's recipient of ARC grants, a whole series of industry grants, industry partnerships, an ARC reviewer, award winning teacher, remarkable international academic career, and it's an odd career too. 
and will increasingly become even stranger. He spent 17 years, 17 years at the one university, at Flinders University. You are a unicorn, sir. <laughs> and of course, as you may have worked out, this poor man, unbelievably, what else is going wrong in his life? He happens to have accidentally got married to me. No. Oh, at some point. Uh, but what Jamie does is he does something that very few people do these days. He's got this incredible research career, but he's also an active teacher. And he teaches throughout the undergraduate science degree. Yes, he teaches first year physics. And that's a whole like, pause, take a breath, think about that. He also teaches through the High Achievers program, honours, and of course, doctoral supervision. So, Jamie, hi. Hi. Hi everyone. Oh. Welcome to our backyard. Welcome to our backyard. I, I do like the idea of being involved in the fourth episode in a Star Wars trilogy. I, I thought you might. Is the, it the rise of the Empire. But is it the prequel but, or is it where is this in the location? I, um, well, I was going to say yeah. since this is about the impact of COVID, it's mm. kind of Star Wars meets War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells. Cool, and you know I'm a big fan of H.G. So Wells. welcome to our backyard, um, <laughs> even though the War of the Worlds happened in New Jersey where I did my personal. That's right, and hi to all our, our friends in New Jersey. We have a lot of friends in New Jersey. So in the US, yeah. let's, let's go here. So let's now go to this moment, if I can. And I want to take you back to something that in real time, as you know, 2 a.m. in the morning in the office next door to you, I, I recognised as significant. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the first two weeks of first year physics, yeah. the first two weeks, and then tell me about week three of first year physics. Uh, so we're talking about semester one, 2020. Let's, which was, let's go back to February, late February, mid-February, late February. Um, and our, our first year physics started in what I would call a conventional sense. And I use the word conventional in a rather strange way because um, our first year physics program is flipped and blended in various ways. Um, but it was rolled out in the way that it's typically rolled out. Um, it comprises uh, four contact hours of lectures and workshops, so two lectures, two workshops each week. Right. And um, a lab program that uh, is roughly one laboratory exercise for three hours once a fortnight. That's Got every it. two weeks for the people in North America. Yes. Um, so that was kind of the way it started and I, I have a series of things that I go through um, as part of the process of introducing, commencing first year students to university, getting them used to the environment um, and so on. And then in week three of semester, um, the rules, the, the way in which engagement occurred changed twice in that one week. So at the beginning of the week, it was decided that lectures would be moved to online. And that happened um, with the imminent concern about COVID spreading in, in South Australia in particular. but. Um, you know, within the university and so forth and, and making sure that people could be safely isolated and socially distanced by not needing to be on campus in a lecture. Yes. And then by the end of that week, on the, I think it was the Thursday, it was decreed that our workshops would also go to online. And the difference between the two is a lecture, a lecture is a lecture. Um, I don't like to give lectures where I'm just talking and people are just passively writing things down. I like it to be a conversation and um, I, I like it to be interactive. The more interactive, the better I find it. Um, but our workshops rely on interaction, right? The workshops re requ require students to work in groups. And at the beginning of semester, they're, they're getting used to things. They're getting used to, who am I in the university system? You know, what does, what does normal look like? Anyway, um, yeah, so, so that's kind of what happened. Um, and I guess we'll take it from there. Right, so very very sharp quick quick uh, changes happen between the second the second week where everything yeah. was going fine yeah. and the third week where there were radical changes and, and I, I appreciate that it, the, those decisions were made in the interest of safety and they, and I do actually like in hindsight the fact that they were staggered because um, you know going to online lectures first um, all of our lectures are pre-recorded and so the notion of what you would need to do to move from being a face-to-face -face lecture to an online recorded lecture yeah. um, have it's not too much of a transition and then get used to that idea and then we're going to render this other mode of learning this mode of delivery this workshop yeah. online 
um, so that it, like if it all happened at once it would have been a much more it was stressful enough but it would have been a much more challenging and stressful situation. Catastrophic movement and so what's fascinating yeah. for those of you that have followed me on the lecture journey so Jamie did move from analog synchronous to yeah. digital and synchronous and then digital asynchronous. I should also say that yeah. in week three so my lectures in week three were recorded in the lecture theatre um, to an empty room. So they were synchronous, so it was a yeah. staggered or scaffolded yeah. series of changes. And, and it was, well, it, it kind of remained synchronous throughout the semester. It wasn't until a few weeks in, into the online delivery, that I started to need or recognise the need to pre-record content. And there were certain situations where it was just far superior. It was a better strategy than to try and do everything synchronously. But most of my classes were delivered synchronously. Remarkable. And we'll come yeah. back to why you made those decisions too. Yeah. Uh, the second question is a big one, and again, I've never asked you this before. What surprised you in the movement to online learning at such speed? I mean, this is not the way you would plan an online learning experience. You would never be making changes like this. But what was the surprise for you through that shift or change? Um, yeah, okay. What a great question. Um, and there are a lot of factors, I think, that would influence my answer to this question. So I guess I'll just try to highlight some of them. So the, the things that I, I was surprised by that were pleasant surprises were, I was really surprised at how adaptable the students were. The students could respond to this much better than I could, right? I, I felt like the dinosaur in the room, in a way, because um, because of course I've got my comfort zone and the students have got their comfort zone and I like to think of it in terms of comfort zones. Um, now I was worried because we've got a new cohort of students, so we're talking about first year, we are. we've got a new cohort of students, I'm trying to get them to understand what normal looks and feels like, but normal, normal disappeared at the end of week two. And um, I've got my own comfort zone and when I'm in my comfort zone I feel that I can do things more effectively and I can, you know, I can connect much better and so forth and so I'm, I'm dragged out of my comfort zone and told come and stand over here and figure it figure it out and um, in some ways you know I was actually pleasantly surprised by my capacity to do that too and it really is um, if you like um, a little bit of uh, you know theory of natural selection at work right your adaptability how do you cope with being put in an unfamiliar situation and um, be able to cope with it, um, yeah. So and as someone, as someone who who has been diagnosed on the autistic spectrum, of course, that's a theme that goes through my life, and it's not it's not just a theme that goes through my life because I know everybody goes through this, right? Everybody's forced to deal with unfamiliar things, but it's always been a, a situation, a, a cause of considerable angst for me, and it's only as someone who is middle aged. Um, He's younger than I am. He does this that, intentionally. Uh, well, I didn't, actually. Chief. Um, I've kind of got to that point now where I'm actually a lot more confident and comfortable with being with being put in situations like that. So, so you get past the initial shock, and then you just try to outthink the problem. Really. Yeah, and I think what what you did is you expressed those concerns and worries, you actually articulated them, which gave your students the permission and the space to express their yeah. concerns as yeah. well. And I think that reflexive space, yeah. and it's, it's very hard to do any time in teaching yeah. and learning, really hard to do when this scale and scope of changes are occurring in real time, and you did it. I, I know that, you know, I just answered that question about me, but mm. for me it wasn't just me, it wasn't, it wasn't no. solely all about me at all, it was actually about... Um, you know the first year students and how are they going to cope with it because I'm okay with being uncomfortable if I can prevent discomfort for the students because the students are at the centre of everything I try to do especially in first year yeah. you know so I mean I love teaching first year first year is first year's just the best it is but um, yeah remarkable but I think how the students adapted I agree with you it, it, yeah. it stunned even me as someone watching it from afar and my third question is about how the first year students coped and I, I suppose we can add a little bit of information this week that that happened that is now relatively public knowledge which is the students that did first year physics with you this year actually averaged a higher grade and mark than the first year students in physics that did it 
last year. Now, mm. marks mean many things and they're mm. a proxy for some things and they're assumed to be a proxy for others and they're often not. Mm. But from that other data point, how do you think those first year students coped? And do we really ever know? Will we ever know? Uh, well, I think we'll find out when they get to higher year levels and we'll see how, how much how much learning has been achieved. I mean, yeah. the grade, the grades are one thing, and, and you know, I like the grades to be a consequence of the learning because the learning is the whole point of the exercise. Yeah. You know, you know, I'm sort of, I guess, I'm being a bit preachy to the converted in a lot of ways. As a teacher, if you, you know, you have to be concerned with the learning of the students. But if we, if we talk about the students and how they coped, um, I kind of want to express it a different way. So. So as the topic coordinator of um, first year, first semester physics, physics 1A we'll call it, um, it's called Fundamental Physics 1 at Flinders, but um, you know, I see my role as someone who tries to create a learning environment for the students. And so the biggest challenge here is the fact that the, the learning environment that I've, I've gone to a lot of trouble to try and create and get the students to get familiar with and then get used to each other and, and work together was disrupted at the end of week two of semester. So no one had a sense of normal yet. We didn't we didn't kind of get into any kind of holding pattern. We started down one path and then we were told we have to change paths. And so, you know, and and not only that, but you know, there's a, there's a bit of a trust relationship there and there should be. You know, a commencing first year student should be able to trust the person that that, that if they fall, you will catch them. That's the that's nature right, of being a first right. year so, teacher. So, so my role is to offer support and guidance and all the rest of it. And all of those things are above and beyond focusing on the learning objective of the topic and the content. This yeah. is about you know, establishing the base needs of the students so that they can thrive in that environment. Now, how do they cope? So, When the environment's um, changed, when the environment's the, ripped away but, from them. But, so there's a couple of ways you could deal with that. And, you know... Um, I, I, I like to try and think about it from the student's point of view, right, from their lens, and I like I like the fact that you're asked that question for that reason. Can you remember when you're in first year? I can, certainly can. Can you, can you remember when you're in first year? I mean, Very I certainly evocative. yeah. I certainly remember when I was in first year, and and so I'm trying. I'm, I, I actually deeply care about that, and I wanted to make sure that the students in my class um, understood that. We've all been pushed out of our comfort zone. You know, at the time, remember on the TV, we were getting um, celebrities saying, you know, we're all in this together, we're all in this together, kind of thing. And, um, you know, we all reacted to those in different ways, I'm sure. Um, yeah. but, I, but rather than try to do the confident, I'm the all knowing, all seeing, all, all everything, just do what I say and everything will be fine kind of approach, which I'm not a fan of, um, instead, I was actually open and, and transparent and honest with the students, and I said to them, um, this is a new situation for me as well and you know I need you to communicate with me more than ever more than what normal even looks like if you, if you knew what normal was so so I basically said to them you know let's actually do this together in a grand experiment style where we'll try various things and, and you know um, in terms of uh, the tools that we had at our disposal I was unfamiliar with the tools and now, um, in going from analog face-to-face -to, -face to online digital, um, it's an environment that's native to the students, right? It's, I mean, I'm not exactly illiterate computer-wise and digital-wise, but, um, but learning something new with no notice, no time to think about it, and implementing it, um, I want to do it as, as effectively as possible. And the best way to learn how to do that is to include the students, and I did. And so, you know, I said to them, we have to discover this together. And I want to know from you what's working well, what's not so, what's not, what not working not so well. And let's make adjustments together so that we can actually make the most of this situation. See, it's brilliant. And I always use that line, you know, we teach what we need to learn. And that's why I think the best teachers are endless learners. We learn and we approach every situation like a learner. Yeah. And I think that's why you my adapted students, so My quickly. students hear that from me a lot. Yeah. I don't go into the classroom to teach and I don't consider myself to be a teacher. I am a learner and I want them to learn and it's a learning experience, a learning journey and we go on the journey together and I go on that journey hoping that I'll learn stuff on the way. And, and, and even after yeah. doing it 17 times, I'm still keen 
that on the 18th time I'll learn something that I didn't learn the first 17 times. And that's why you're Jamie Quinton. Now I want to get to, we've talked about the, the sharp end of the change, like ooh, ooh, yeah. ooh, this happened and yeah. how did you react and, and how I did mean, you get ahead of yeah, the problem? That was week two and three, but yeah. the changes kept happening and they happened about four or five times. Oh, that, it, was, it was a stunning thing to watch, but I suppose that there's those shorter term challenges and issues. Mm. But then I want to just take a step back for a moment, and this is where my bit of the story comes in, I suppose, is that, you know, to be frank, hi Frank, hi Frank, uh, online learning has frank been in frank. existence for decades. I took my first course online in 1998. I wrote my first refereed article on online learning in 1999. Some of you may not, were maybe not even born then, okay, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I got so aggressive and concerned about it. Everyone was going, oh, so many changes, oh, online learning, oh, the digital lecture. And yet, for 20 years, this thing has been in existence. So why was the shock so great? So, well, I think I have an idea, perhaps why. Yeah, I, I'm why um, is. So it. right now I'm thinking of uh, hopefully the soon-to-be Dr. Narelle Hunter. I don't know her. Um, and talking about disciplinary literacy and information literacy nice. and digital literacy, actually, in this situation. Um, so we have had an online presence in all of our subjects, courses, topics, what they're called topics of lenders, um, for many, many years now, probably 15 years. Uh, yes. And, and there are a huge number of tools that we use to deliver our courses. You're in Moodle. Yeah, so we're using Moodle as our learning management system, uh, but it wasn't always Moodle. No. Right? And, um, you know, you, you're influenced by the way you were taught, the way you learned, and it's perfectly natural for every teacher um, to start from that position, right? This is how I learned this material. I will try and deliver it the way that I've learned it and synthesized it and, and assimilated it. Um, and to do it a different way requires planning. You, you can't just, oh, well, it's a different medium, different approach, different thing. Just do the same. I mean, it's actually really difficult to do. It is. Um, and the opportunities existed for a long time, right? The tools have existed for a long time. Um, but if you think about what's required, so um, let's let's be more specific, right? So if we go from delivering a lecture face to face, one to a room full of people, yes. you might have a PowerPoint slides, or you might have, um, you know, you might not. You might just communicate with the students. Or analog props yeah. or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Music, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah. and and definitely. Do, doing face-to-face -face lectures, that's what they are typically like, um, to suddenly sitting in front of what we would have used for things like Skype, um, so occasional meetings, we, most of our meetings were still face-to-face -face if we could do it, um, we travel large distances on aeroplanes to go to places and have day-long workshops and meetings, right? Um, before COVID, that was still the norm. Yeah. Um, and then to render the content and the message, render the message, I actually prefer to say the message, from doing it face to face where you can see the instant reaction of the students, you know whether they get what you're trying to say, you can even ask them quite easily, you know, um, to being put in an unfamiliar environment where you don't know how you're going to do that. Yeah. And that's just the design of the delivery of the message. Yeah. You've then got how do I have the digital literacy to record the message, get the message into the learning management system, and render it effective to the learning of the student? That's actually a lot of steps. Yeah. It's actually a lot of steps. And if you don't know, if you're not comfortable and confident with every single one of those steps, you're not going to do it. You're going to revert back to, well, I know what I'm doing here, and I know that as effective or not I might happen to be, that's going to be the most effective way that I can get the message across. Really powerfully said. I mean, it's a different skill set. As we sort of talked about through this series, the, the digital lecture is a confusion, really, because that noun lecture is putting us off. It's actually a very different way of packaging up form and content. And if you take digital learning seriously, as I've often said, it changes everything. Right? from the ground up and of course you can't change everything from the ground up if you're changing midstream in the middle of a semester and that's probably one of the reasons yeah.
that it was so volatile and so stressful for so many people. Yeah, and, and I think uh, being able to adapt to develop that literacy and do it with no time, and and you know, to the university's credit, they had um, it was everything was in an emergency sort of mode. Yeah. There were um, courses on about different tools so and that people could get familiar. But familiarity is the first step, right? It's not all the steps is the first step. You still you still need to be able to do it and confidently do it and know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and so people, I, I think people haven't, they weren't ready for the change, they weren't ready for the tools, they weren't ready for that mode, right? Yeah. And it wasn't something that we had, we had some support but we didn't have much by way of support. It was everything just in time, but Ooh. even just in time learning as a model has its issues, right? For, um, for the teachers and learn the learners. And, and that's the point. So you can do just-in-time learning if the teacher is supporting the just-in-time learning, right? Um, I'm not, personally not a fan of it as a mode myself, but, but when the teacher has to do it just-in-time, you know that communication theory, lost in translation, you know, the end message, the thing that really matters is compromised. Yeah, and the stress on everybody to try and even create any mode of deliverable is beyond belief really. And if I can, I want to go, because I mean the literature is starting to emerge on COVID, post-COVID universities, but where I think the literature is undercooked is with regard to labs. There's been a lot of chatting about the online lecture, online tutorials, online seminars, online PD and so forth. The online lab and what happened to labs this year, that's very undercooked in the literature. So here's one I prepared earlier. What happened? Okay, so the labs. Um, the lab course is a well-developed uh, program of a sequential set of experimental tasks and exercises that have scaffolded principles and concepts and theory and you know they happen once every two weeks so student comes into the lab the lab's actually not only been um, designed to impart those core skills but in the same way that the content in the lectures and the workshops are there to give the students a variety of experiences and modes the lab course is the same and, it, and it's centered around the students being in the room working together in pairs and, and going happens. through a sequence of things, right? Yep. Now, um, at least in this case with labs, it wasn't a snap decision at the end of week three, for instance, that labs are going to do this, but at least there was an opportunity to have a conversation about it and plan for it. Uh, and so there was a conversation about this, right? We have a topic that's going to go until May, June, um, it looks like there's a good chance that the students will need to be off campus because there's going to be a lockdown. What are we going to do about the labs? And so the conversation started from that position and, um, you know, what think about the learning objectives of a laboratory, right? You, we don't tend to just make students do things because we want to make them do things. There's got to be a purpose, a learning objective behind them. Yes. And the laboratory's learning objectives are about the hand, eye, brain working together to develop the experimental skills um, so that when they finish their course, they achieve a certain number of skills that they can then translate to whatever they do next. Um, and we're talking about Physics 1A in my case, right? The habits and the the experiences, what, 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 what is normative for a student in their course is set up in the first semester of their experience. So the lab course, of course, is that point where the students get the most immersive experience and guidance and mentorship from someone who's more experienced than they are in the discipline that we're playing in. So, you know, if you want to uphold the standards and you want to make sure the learning objectives are achieved, you've got to, you've got to hold on hard and go staunch. And I did. And I just said, this is we can't render them in an online form and achieve the same outcomes. And that was the question put to us, right? What should we do with labs? Should we, um, should we try various things and 
um, the, the, the notion that was vetted was how about we get the demonstrators to perform the experiments, record the performance of the experiment, and then in the online situation give the students the data that would have been obtained by them if they had done the experiment and get them to do the analysis and so forth. Now, that's better than nothing, but in terms of getting confident with equipment and getting confident with thinking through the process, it's a lot harder to do that way and I thought it would be compromised beyond the point of being sensible. So I fought back against it and I said, um, if, it's, if labs are going to be not something we can do face to face, why don't we hit the pause button, have incomplete grades, get the students off, off campus, do whatever we do, and then when the lockdown stops, we'll get them back in and we'll do it intensively or something. Still not my favourite solution, but something. Um, and that was the stance, that was the position. And my colleagues and I were talking about this in physics across all the year levels, what do we do? And my position was even more strongly held on by my colleagues who were thinking about second and third year students. Because the third year laboratory, for example, they play with really complicated apparatus and equipment. And we need them to get that familiarity and that process and, and those that literacy because, of course, when they get to research, they come into my lab and they're playing with a one and a half million dollar electron microscope of which there's only two in Australia of that kind, right? Um, and I don't want them playing with my one and a half million dollar microscope if all they've ever done, experimental-wise, is watch other people do experiments and say, oh yeah, I've seen someone use that before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's where that's come from and, and that's where that was around week four of semester. And then from there, the approach that I took was, um, I'll just go into shutdown mode and I'll just ignore that mode. Um, but as we were working out the online environment and getting familiar and thinking more about, okay, I'm starting to get you know, used to being in this space and the students are getting used to it. And I found ways to interact with them the way that I told you I like to interact with them. Um, so I found that I can do pretty much anything in the online environment that I can do in the face-to-face -face environment if I think carefully about how I go about it and I take my time with it rather than try and rush through it. Um, and sometimes that means that the amount of material I'll cover in a lecture might be slightly less than it would be face-to-face, -face, but I then record other video to finish it off and I render it online and then invite the students to watch it and talk about it. Um, in workshops or on, in the online discussion or whatever. So there's a way to make it work. You've just got to outthink the problem. Right? Do you want to offer, offer um, a final couple of comments about Mathematica? Too? And I was going to say, and with the lab, yeah. I, know I, I know I'm laboring the answer. No, you're not. With, it's with the it's lab, fascinating. so I'm thinking about, I'm trying to express the process rather than the details yes. of what we did. So, so in week four and five, the contact with the students was reduced. I'm watching their level of engagement plummet because they're on the online environment. And I was thinking carefully about this, right? As I said before, the online environment's actually more native to the students than it is to us. But if you think about what they typically use it for, they use it for different engagement and interaction than what we require of them in the classroom. Learning to leisure, right? Yes, learning to leisure. And of course, if you know, if it's normal for them to watch something short and if they get fed up with it, they click away from it and it's click till you find something you like, that's detrimental to learning in an online environment. Um, but with regard to the labs, what I decided to do was say, well, I actually need them to maintain the contact time. So let's do something that's native and digital and the environment is actually designed to handle. And in terms of literacies that I can develop in the discipline of physics with my students, let's develop something that will be helpful to them. And one of the things they do in their lab course is they do a simulation in the middle of every experiment. It's only a short simulation and the, and the code is given to them. I wrote that code, or I keep revising it, but um, I provide the code. Whereas, let's actually get them to learn some literacy in that simulation environment because they're going to need it when they get to later years anyway and it will help them visualize some of the abstract conceptual mathematical things that they'll meet in physics and maths and engineering or chemistry or anything really um, and so Mathematica is the environment we use for that 
And I designed a couple of experiments to get the students familiar and then develop some basic skills and literacies and mathematical. And I tried to do that. Um, I planned for a three lab program. So that way, if all we got through were these three labs, that wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, and I designed the first one, tested the first one, rolled out the first one. And as I was in the middle of getting ready, I designed the second one, was about to roll out the second one. I was told, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to go back to recording the video of the demonstrators doing the experiment and give the students the data. We don't want any incomplete grades and so forth. And so at that point, I just kind of accepted that that's what's going to happen. And then it was a case of how do we now make that work? And now I've got an extra challenge. Not only have we not done the mass production video thing, um, but now I've got to involve people who are students. And, you know, students like giving presentations, right? They do. Um, imagine <laughs> saying to them, I'm going to video record you doing this, and you need to teach while you're doing it. So, you know, it was clunky, it was ordinary, but we got better at it. But, but there are seeds of great innovation there. It was great for your demonstrators because they learned Absolutely. a new way of demonstrating and a new way of engaging with the students. I still think as sort of a, a person watching you that the Mathematica uh, solution to labs was a very, very strong one because it was and is nested into the digital environment. Yeah. So I think going forward, and we, we may talk yeah. about where the hell any of this is going to go, yeah. I think that one week, two week, three week experiment that you configured in experimentation, no, think, that's meaningful. I think that goes back to educational design. It does. Don't and it. when you talk about educational yeah. design, the first principle that you must uphold after I want to create the right learning environment for the learning I want to achieve is how do I use the learning environment in the most effective way? In this situation, I didn't choose the learning environment, it was chosen for me. But, after I had the shock and the freak out of, oh, this is gonna go pear-shaped really quickly, what do I do? I stopped and thought about it and said, this is the environment I've been handed, what can I do with it to render it the most effective I can? And that's where I went to the, let's develop that literacy thing. Absolutely legendary. And now I want to get to the innovations. And I think Mathematica is one going forward. I'd like you to write that up because I think that's a thing. But you did implement a series of profound innovations that I was watching in real time from altering the length of the sessions of your lecture. So your lecture 50 minutes. All of a sudden, very quickly within a couple of weeks, the length of your lectures altered radically. And you may want to talk about optics as well, but it went to very short, a series of very short ones, to longer ones, fascinating things occurred. And then of course, pen casts, pen casts. So can you tell us something, the meta point, what does digital diversity give to a course? Yeah. Um, well, fundamentally, you've got more than one way you can do something. When you're doing an analog lecture, it's kind of, there's only really one way to do it. You've got your tools and your demonstrations and so forth. And, and a lot of these innovations have happened through experience, right? It's been learning-led rather than... Um, um, well, it's exper planned, ex right? Exper experiential, quite yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, that didn't work so well. What can I do to make that better? So if I just talk about um, higher year levels, I teach um, optics in second year physics. I found that those students didn't engage. They would rather watch the recording of the video than be there to talk about the content and ask the questions to clarify things. And it's interesting, and I mean, I do clarify to the students that the purpose of a lecture is not to teach them the material. They're responsible for their learning. My role is in a lecture to highlight what they need to learn. And it's a very subtle thing, but it's actually a really important thing. Um, so yeah, so the second year students, of course, normal for them was disrupted. Normal for them was turning up, being in the room, right? And now it's being rendered online, where that's where their leisure space is, right? So they didn't turn up. They weren't there for any synchronous classes, or some of them were, and I, I should acknowledge those that were. And I've got to tell you, you know, when I look at the second year results, the students who are engaged and communicated and so forth, they performed better than the ones that didn't. And it wasn't a case of, oh, I, I know that person, I'll mark them more, more, more generously. Not at all. 
it was a case of they knew the content because they focused on the content and learned the content. Whereas, and so it was very bimodal. You either knew it or you didn't know it. Yeah. Um, anyway, getting back to the digital innovation, the innovations. Um, so it started really with um, the literacies of the first years and the diversity of the cohort because some students have done some very advanced maths and physics before they come to university and some of them have done absolutely none. And a student gets, you know, every student has a point where if they don't understand something and have that basic literacy, that's the end point. And it doesn't matter what you throw at them after that, they just go, I'm blinded in the headlights, right? Yeah. Um, so the pen casts were an opportunity for me to develop some tools, some literacy, some things that some students would have learned in high school, some students will learn in Maths 1A, some students will learn in Physics 1, you know. Um, but they're things that allow me to normalise the experience so that I know that at least they're all told about this or this. And the idea of the pen cast is it's a short um, chalk and talk, but it's recorded and I can talk about the thinking while I'm doing it rather than just here's a piece of paper with the answer on it. And I can focus on little individual things. So a student can go, oh, I know what vectors are, I don't need to look at this vectors pen cast. Or, well, I have um, no idea what vectors or, are. Or I need me. to refresh um, my basic calculus, here is some basic calculus. Right? So I'm not trying to teach them calculus because I think I can do it better than the mathematicians. I really don't think I can do it better than the mathematicians. But it's there so that they can go, oh, that's right. Because you know, when you when you're in front of a student and you say, "Do you remember this?" You're asking them a black and white question. That's a yes and no type answer, and they'll err on the side of saying no, yeah. rather than go. Because I think if I say yes, you're going to ask me something, and if I get caught out, I look stupid, yeah. and it's yeah. unsupported, right? So so yeah. So the pen cast was one way, and then when it comes to the digital um, recordings of things and lectures and what is a lecture and what should a lecture look like in this new environment. Uh, I found that with my demonstrations, if you're in a room full of people and you've got a demonstration, you've got a way to show them the demonstration. You can do something on a large scale, you can do something with a camera and a live projector. Um, but when you're doing something synchronously and you've got the camera pointed at you Flat. and you've got slides with content to sort of outline what you want them to know, and then you've got a demonstration, you, you don't have the opportunity a student has, which is to look in different places. The camera's fixed, it's pointed in the one place, and if I'm holding up something like a gyroscope and going, look at this thing, I can't do anything with it that's, that I could do if I had it sitting on its own, and I had a camera that I could move around and, and show different things. Dimensions. So when it came to delivering demonstrations, I started to realise that doing it synchronously and embedding it in a lecture is not a sensible thing to do in a digital environment. So instead, I start recording modules, blocks, snippets, and that's the one advantage of the digital environment that the analogue environment doesn't have. So how do you combine them? The balance of analogue and digital in the in the online environment is different than the balance of analog and digital in it, the face to face and it requires overt careful consideration of the relationship between form and content and your student group and yeah. multiple scaffolds are available in fact more scaffolding is available digitally than in an analog environment but but it's much more work for the teacher yeah. much more work for the teacher last couple of questions and these are the biggies these are the biggies for everybody out there really i suppose do you think that there will be long-term consequences, impacts of COVID on teaching and learning in our universities? So say a vaccine is found in the next four or five months, mm -hmm. maybe, and you know, supposedly the COVID problem goes away. Mm -hmm. Do you think this moment that we've all shared will change teaching and learning, will change our universities forever? I do. Um, I'm going to be evocative and I'm going to say that uh, I expect that teaching and learning will actually improve afterwards. And I'll say that because of the following idea. Uh, the, more, the more tools that a teacher has at their disposal to impart their message, the better that teacher can convict potentially 
yeah. I suspect that the university sector will now try to move more into the online space because you know in the past it's been slow uptake in transitioning into online spaces and then there are some universities that focus on online spaces so everybody's got their own little landscape and patch of ground to play in. Um, this is now going to create competition in the online delivery of content and um, we will get better at it because now it will start to become something that's normative for us. Yeah. So I think, I think it has potential to be better. Um, the rest of it will come down to how do universities teach, what do we teach and why do we teach it and how do we teach it. I think the how do we teach it will transform. Um, I do hope though that, that by saying I think it, it has a potential to be better, on the other hand I hope that um, sensibility still prevails and people actually consider carefully why they're doing what they're doing rather than take the easy path of now that everybody knows how to do things online let's just render everything online. And, and, and the learning, the learning, which is the purpose, the purpose gets lost in the cost savings of the approach. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, the right mode of delivery to, to give the right message in the right context to, for to the, the purpose of yeah. literacy. See, from my perspective, there, there are only two, two things we need to consider. The first thing is, what are the learning outcomes? What are the learning outcomes? And the second question is, who are the students? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the sociological transformation of higher education students in the last 20 years, particularly the last 10, they're getting older, much more experienced, uh, a, a much more complex array of skills that students are arriving to our universities already holding and other skills that they don't have. So digitisation can create that plurality of scaffolding to enable a diversity of students to find their new way to those learning outcomes. But if we can focus on those two variables, the students and the learning outcomes, yeah, I agree. Th then pick the combination of platforms and interfaces, mm -hmm. analog, digital, synchronous, asynchronous, that suit those students. Powerful. Yeah. I think as long as we remain student focused, um, you know, there will always be hope there. Yeah, and if, uh, I mean, I'm quite emotional in terms of that because uh, I mean, the problem we've got is that student focus that's become a cliche. You know, it's like like all these other words at the moment: you're agile, resilient. You know, these these words and these words actually do have important meaning in our lives and in culture, but they're so overused and overworked by people that we despise that um, it, it's almost impossible to use them with a straight face, but, but actually student-centred, student, -centered, student what, what is, who are our learners and why should they care? It's these sorts of conversations we need to bring back. And that leads me to the final question for you, and I've loved this. This has really been a pleasure and a privilege, sir. And I want to finish with a question about SOTL, the scholarship of teaching and learning, or ISOTL, the international <laughs> a I scholarship. The internet version. No, I wish no. I saw all the international scholarship of teaching and learning, and of course, learning-led research. A phrase I'm a big believer in. Now, through this rather extraordinary semester, you wrote a learning-led, a subtle article titled "Panic Learning: Teaching and Learning on and Off the COVID Campus." Now, well, I co-authored it. This is amazing to me because how important do you think is this type of research, this type of publication, this type of article for academics right now? Why this is unusual is, as I was reviewing all your uh, refereed articles this morning, you have very rarely, you very rarely written on teaching learning matters. You, you are a proper experimental physicist and even though you're this remarkable teacher, that has not left its fingerprints on your research. So for the students out there, the PhD students out there right now watching this, as someone who hasn't done a lot of work in this area, what are your views on research in teaching, learning-led research? Okay. Uh, so research and teaching should go hand in hand together. There should be a very strong nexus between the two. Um, because if we go back to the learning objectives, why do people want to learn? 
Um, I think people want to learn because they want to be able to appreciate all of the developments that are happening at, at the forefront of the discipline that they're working in. So research should inform teaching, and in some ways, teaching should also inform research. The two should go together. Uh, now, in terms of learning-led research, um, as a teacher, as a, as a learner, um, and why don't I have lots of publications on Sotil, um, is because I suppose it's partly because of why I do it and what I want to get out of it and what I enjoy from it. Um, I enjoy the interaction with the students and I enjoy watching the students develop and grow in their own capacity for learning and watching them learn and develop their knowledge. That's what I really like about it. Um, I'm not so fond of, you know, I'm not well versed and equipped with, oh, here's something I can try, I know, I can write a paper on that. I don't tend to go there, that's not where my default stance is. And certainly, you know, lots of opportunities have gone because of that. And I don't know if I will tell you that. <laughs> that, that happens a lot. And um, there's a generosity there, I guess, you know, you that goes with that. <coughs> um, but apart from that, um, learning-led research, you know, I have to, I have to go back to Norell again. Um, I think the sector has transformed and I think we're more aware than ever that our role as a, as a teacher now is not to teach the students, you know. Yes, it, it's, and what I'm, what I'm thinking about there is content, right? We deliver content and as an expert we can deliver the content to someone who doesn't know the content and try and render them as an expert of the content. Um, I think that's probably fundamentally what most people think teaching and learning is about but I don't believe it's like that anymore you know with the digital age that we live in and the free access to information our role has transformed from being a teacher who delivers content to being more a mentor or, or a guide who says you know how do you know how to develop your capacity as a learner you can get access to the information. How do you know what information is useful and what information is not? Yes. How do you develop not just your knowledge, but your capacity to develop your knowledge? Yes. So now, yes. it's a much deeper. It's a much. It's actually a much more privileged and a much more important task. And intricate. Very right. intricate. It's a far more important task than just oh, you come to class, I go through this information, and you go away, and, and I've done and, my and job. And repeat it. Yeah. So. So learning led research back in. Yeah, learning led research is actually about how can I as an educator, as a person who designs an educational experience, um, a learning environment for the students and supporting them through their learning journey, how can I do that better? So now it's not just about learning, but it's about learning how to help them learn. And learning led research is a, is a great way to do that. Yes, and, and so this co-authored article on the COVID um, panic experience, learning, panic learning, out soon, um, is brilliant. And the reason I like it is because in technical science, if you like, we have more null results than we have definitive results. And when we go to publish peer-reviewed publishing of technical papers, if you don't have definitive results, it doesn't get published. It's not considered to be good research. Whereas learning-led research in a subtle situation, everything in the journey is important. What didn't work? What did you try? Why didn't it work? And it might not be that it was a bad idea. It might be that the implementation was not ideal or, you know, and so there's, it's multifaceted. There's so many things to think about. And you, sh and the difference, I guess, also is in subtle, everyone's completely open and, and loves to share what they've done because we all want to get the most we can out of it. What would you say though, because obviously you're now obviously still much younger than me, but what would you say to what would you say to an early career researcher or a PhD out there? So if you had your time over again, let's ask it like this. If you had your time over again, because you've you've gone down the physics path and you've had a great career because of that, 
would your career have been enhanced or do you think there would have been some detraction there if every now and again, once every couple of years, you'd taken a pause and done a learning-led or subtle piece? Would that have enhanced your career or would have had held it back I think I think in hindsight, I regret the opportunities that I didn't take. So there were certainly several of them, right? So um, I, I was involved um, in a subtle program so we had um, um, a national project that we we're a part of that was led by uh, Jerry Lafoe. Hi Jerry if you're watching um, and um, Dom, Dominic Parrish who's now at UQ I think or QUT. I'm not sure sorry Dom if you're watching it's it's in Queensland in Brisbane um, she's now in one of the faculty faculties of science um, but I was the inaugural faculty scholar at Flinders and we had a faculty scholar program where each of the faculties at the time had one person identified as a scholar to tackle some forefront subtle challenges that existed within the context of the tertiary education sector at that time. And mine was about assessment and um, what's now called constructive alignment between um, the learning objectives, the assessment and then achieving the outcomes because um, you know, at the time it was a bit arbitrary. We had all these aspirational objectives and then assessment was more of a how do you implement something practically on the fly at the last second, hoping, assuming that they're achieved. Yeah, constructive again. alignment is everything. That, that changed generations, generations of teachers. But, um, you know, there's only maybe two or three publications there. So in technical research you tend to have an eagle eye and you go looking for all of the different ways in which you can publish it. In Sodal you don't tend to do that, you tend to tell one story and then you kind of leave it. I think it, what I regret is not doing more of, more of the same there. The so, opportunity is gone. So. So, so, so for students thinking that, I mean I think that's quite a powerful reflection back mm. on this and this COVID period. Um, so. Jamie, all I'd say to you is someone sort of was sharing a house with you in sort of the 2am to 5am working slot during the last semester. It's been an absolute privilege to watch somebody do what you've done. It's been a privilege to see your remarkable students rise to an impossible challenge and do better in their, t in their learning than previous generations because they've had to be agile and overcome so much. We'll see. We'll see. Um, I, I'm, I'm keen to know how their learning has compared with the previous year's learning, uh, which I won't that. know, which I won't know until I get to second and third year, because um, the assessment, the final exam, was not a sit-down exam, and it was shorter. I made it a two-hour exam rather than a three-hour exam, and I did that exam in the online environment. So there were some things that I could test and probably over test and then there were other things that I couldn't test that you would be able to test more easily in a written exam. So, so, so getting that balance right and again that was another one of those experiments um, and we do have, we do, we have had a, a good response, the students have done quite well. Um, so it's kind of been interesting to watch and learn from. Look at how it's, you know, and, Second semester starts on Monday, um, and now we're sort of a little bit forearmed and forewarned, and um, yeah. But what what I'd say is a lot of us got into this business, into universities, because we believed in you know change and seeing what happens and experimenting, experimenting bravely, having a go, innovating. Try, tr changing, well, challenging. If you're yeah, but I, I sort of didn't even mean that in terms of our own university, but mm -hmm. you know, that's what we, we got into this business to, to see, to be innovative, to have the best and brightest people in the world in the classroom, and together, let's do something brilliant. Let's create some magic. Mm -hmm. And through pretty mediocre learning management systems and pretty mediocre and commas standards in international higher education, I think a lot of us lost our way. And I'm hoping what COVID at its best in the long term did was remind us of that journey, remind us of the excitement, remind us of the energy, stuff goes wrong, stuff goes right, always that interesting. And remind us that there is research in and through the teaching. And that I think is the gift that Jamie has it given us this morning. It certainly did make us stop and think, right? Yeah. Uh, 
and I think that's a good thing. Look, it is. It's powerful, and let's see where we go from here. But Jamie Dalman, thank you so much for the time that we've shared this morning, and My we pleasure. wish you love, light, and peace. Jamie and T out.